Um, so let's do another round of applause for Dr. Sarah Bunin Ben Orr. Um, yeah, so that was so, so amazing and so informative and wonderful for, for us to learn, to learn from you. So thank you so much for that. And now we're going to transition into more specifically theater that happens in Jewish languages and that has happened for a long time in Jewish languages. So first, let's define what Jewish theater is. What are what are we talking about here? So I I want to use this definition today that it's theater by Jews and usually for Jews, and it's often in Jewish languages. And a lot of times it might deal with content concerning Jewish traditions, values, stories, humor, culture, all of that. It doesn't always, but essentially it has one. It has one or more of these um, of these qualities to make it Jewish theater in our definition for today. So we're going to look at three different. Um, areas of Jewish theater because I don't have time to talk about all of my research. But you'll see in the exhibit in the next couple weeks on the website, you can look and find a lot more. But we're going to talk about the origin of the Purim Spiel. And we're going to talk about modern modern usage of, um, of the languages in post-vernacular situations in Turkey and in Israel. So we're going to start with a moment to think about what connects all of these different all of these different theater initiatives around the world and throughout time like why are they why do they mean anything to each other so this quote or this um little tidbit is sort of to show how how long Jewish theater has been happening so there was an Alexandrian Jew named Ezekielos who made a a drama about the exodus in the second century BCE and he he wrote it and some of it is still um you have parts of it are um preserved and that is you know so long ago and so much has happened since then in so many different places that it's um it's just really interesting that throughout time and place we use Jewish language in drama as a storytelling device and all of the theater initiatives that we talk about today are connected because they all come from the impulse to create community and to connect with our culture and our heritage. They come from the same need for all of that um, and I want to have that baseline before we continue. So we're going to start with the Purim spiel. So um, Purim is, for those who don't know, a holiday that recounts the bravery of Mordechai and Esther. They were ancient Persian Jews who stood up to a plot to kill all of the Jews in the kingdom. And the Jews of this kingdom, Shushan, survived. And as a result, we get silly every year. So many communities tell the story in a theatrical, over-the-top, silly, goofy performance. And that performance we like to call the Purim Spiel. And if you have heard the word spiel before, you, um, you it's a lot of, used in Jewish English. Um, we hear it a lot in our daily lives um, that it's just, it's a... You, I you, I you can know what a spiel is, but um, <laughs> but so it's a spiel about Purim, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, before we talk about the modern times and what we do today with that. Um, I want to talk about a long time ago. So go ahead and close your eyes. We're gonna do an exercise. And close your eyes and imagine yourself in 15th century Eastern Europe. So that could mean a lot of things, but right now we're going to focus on right now you're in your dining room at your table with your family and it's Purim and it's time to re read Megillat Esther, the story of Esther, and you sit at your large dining table, you have friends and family commemorating the holiday with a festive meal. Your sister laughs as your nephew refills the wine glasses, and outside you hear the clip-clop of horses' hooves and the voices of the players slowly coming within your shot. It's almost time for the Purim play. So open your eyes and let's talk about it. 
So in the 15th century, the Purim Spiel had its start as a traveling act. So there was a troop of well-known Jewish community members, not professional actors, but people that were known by each other. They went from home to home telling the Purim story. So everyone would be sitting in their homes eating their festive meal, and they'd hear, oh, they're coming. And then they'd come through the door and they'd say, okay, it's time. And then everyone would say, okay, great. And they would do the play for them, and then they would go to the next house. And that is the way that they would do it at the beginning. And it was um, inspired by things like Christmas caroling and things that were happening in Eastern Europe at the time in surrounding communities. And it really started from there. So this picture is from the 17th century, um, and it's a drawing of Purim players um, in in that time, that time period and how it's, it's continued throughout this time. So there's a lot to unpack and discuss about original Purim spiels, but you'll see that in the coming weeks. But um, the interesting thing that I want to talk about today is the similarity of the silliness that has been maintained throughout this, all of this time. And um, one of the things that I think contributes to how fun a Purim spiel is supposed to be is that the people who are performing are not outsourced. And they're, they're not people that are necessarily professional actors. They could be. But a lot of times they are from within the community. And we know them as dentists and waitresses and journalists and different things. And we see them on stage. And that's fun because we know them. And we get to go up to them after and say, so, you you know, you remembered all your lines, or before we can say, "Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna mark when you when you mess up," or or there's there's that silliness that comes along with knowing the people, and that has main, been maintained for hundreds of years. Just that one aspect, and I think that sort of that sort of tradition that has continued is really really amazing. So. Now we're going to move into Jewish theater in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire previously. So, uh, so the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, um, from Spain and over to the Ottoman Empire. So Jews went from Spain to lots of different places, but right now we're going to talk about moving to the Ottoman Empire and to modern-day Turkey and, and Istanbul. So um, Sephardic Jews brought 15th century Spanish language with them, and it continued to develop independently from the Spanish that we might know today in Spain or in Latin America. And so this is Ladino, Judeo-Spanish, like, like Sarah said, and Ladino is, um, is in the endangered, moribund sort of area. So... Since Jews' arrival in the Ottoman Empire after the 1492 Spanish expulsion, they have had an impact on Jewish theater from the beginning. So there was this development of a type of theater, Orta Oyunu, or the theater in the round, and it was heavily influenced by Jews in the early Republican era. And then flash forward about 500 years, and in the 70s, the 1970s, um, a large number of Turkish Jews moved to Israel. And so there were a lot less Jews who spoke Ladino, Judeo-Spanish in Turkey itself, in the Ottoman, in that area, in Istanbul. And so this erosion of the speakers in, in Turkey created a need for revival. And so there were these attempts to preserve the Judeo-Spanish language through music and theater. And so one of those efforts that started in the 70s was um, Moiz plays. So Moiz is a, is a type of word to say Moses. So it's one of the, one of the different variations of Moses, Moshe, Moisha, you know, all of the different things. And so Jojo Eskenazi is a, is a man in Turkey who created these plays, and he plays the character of Moiz. And they are the longest-running plays using Judeo-Spanish, and the series has continued since the 70s with lots of runs of different, different storylines with the same characters. And so they're about 
so Moise is a middle class Jewish businessman in Turkey, and he he and his wife Clarette speak Judeo Spanish together and with their elders, and they speak Turkish with their children and their in laws and neighbors. So there's multiple languages happening at once on the stage, and they're family comedies. There's slapstick. They have this vaudevillian structure and satirical and political undertones and. People love them because they're fun and they are funny and they help to preserve the language. So they create a space for people to hear the language in a fun way, especially for the young, the younger generations, because the youngest generation of speakers is the grandparent generation in Istanbul. And so it's important for the young people to be exposed in an interesting way. And the mix of Judeo, Spanish and Turkish on the stage make it for a larger amount of people to be able to understand it. So... Moise plays are also facilitators of community building because, um, for instance, in 2013 and 2015, there were performances that had the intention of fundraising for scholarships for students at a local Jewish private school. And so that helps, um, that is helping the Jewish community directly as well. And I had the wonderful opportunity to speak with um, a professional in Turkey, um, Karen Gershon Sarhon, who is um, really wonderful and committed to preservation of Judeo-Spanish in lots of areas, including theater, and also in music and in publications and all sorts of different ways. And she was part of the Moise plays at the beginning. She played the original Moise's wife, Clarette. That was her at the beginning. Um, and so I was able to interview her, and she was telling me that when she was a kid in Istanbul, Jews mostly lived close together. And it was a small community. It was a small... Istanbul was smaller, and everyone lived closer together. And after school, the kids would go to the youth the youth club and hang out and make theater together and um, just create. And now Istanbul is a lot larger, and people are more spread out, and there's traffic, and it's harder to get to the youth club. And logistics are hard, and so there's less togetherness, and there's less opportunity to create together. Um, and she says that it's difficult to find people who are able to, uh, to act in Ladino. Um, so it's, it's been a struggle, but she says, but we're doing fine. That's what she said. So, so now we're going to talk about some more post-vernacular um, activity in Israel. So we're going to talk about a few different languages that are that are being preserved in various in various theater theatrical ways and um so just a just a reminder of what post vernacularity means is you know it's no longer used for communication between people it's used in a symbolic way and it's used in in art or in theater and um it's not spoken for communication but in Israel, where the revival of Hebrew often meant the discouragement of using other languages, immigrants crave cultural events in their mother tongues. And not only that, but the descendants of immigrants long to feel connected to their heritage. So Israeli Jewish theater appears in languages like the Juhuri that, um, that Sarah spoke about, or the Maghrebi from Morocco and Amharic from Ethiopia. So in Israel, uh, theater is one of the only public arenas in the country where Jewish languages are used naturally as a primary form of communication between characters on stage and between stage and audience, which is so precious and so special for, um, for the people who, who want to hear it, who don't hear it very much, because in, in Israeli culture, Mostly they speak Hebrew, and they don't hear their language as much as they could. And so Jewish Maghrebi is the language of Moroccan Jews. So there is a Moroccan Jewish community in Israel. And I read um, by uh, in, a, in a paper by Sarit Kaufman Simchon, who has a new book out in Hebrew that I haven't read because it's in Hebrew, but that I wish I could read, and maybe one day I will. 
But in English, I read that she said, for those for whom Jewish Mug Rebbe is not to post vernacular, those who still speak it, the happy reunion with their language in a public space constitutes an affirmative action. However, for the Israeli-born spectators of Moroccan descent, this very same language triggers imagined nostalgia, which is intimately intertwined with the history of migration in Israel. So after seeing theater in the Maghrebi language in Israel, native speakers, Moroccan Jews, have never-ending praise for it. So here we have a couple of quotes of people who haven't heard their language on a stage before and haven't lived in the, their home, their original homes where they heard the language all the time for, for many years. And so um, the top one is, um, you know, the show is wonderful. It brings back words, memories, you know, proverbs, things that you didn't, you didn't think of, but then you heard it and you remembered it. And you're like, oh, oh, I loved that. I, I forgot about that and that, that joy. And then the second one is it's um, a father talking to, talking to his son, and he's saying, like, I laughed and I cried, and I forgot how beautiful and funny my language is, and, and I haven't seen your mother laughing like that in a really long time. And that is so precious and so, so important because just being able to sit back and relax and understand what's happening without having to translate all the time and without having to work so hard to to be connected you're able to just ah, and laugh and just be there and that is so important and it's really wonderful that this is able to happen for these people so um, that's some of the importance of post vernacular post vernacular activity and so another initiative is the Amharic Ethiopian, Ethiopian Theater. It's called Tizida, um, which means memories or nostalgia. And it was established by, um, by Fruit Farada in 2016. So these are some of the players. I couldn't find a video of this one, but there will be a video soon of a different, of a different troupe. And um, so these are the players of Tizita, the Amharic Ethiopian Theater in Israel, established by Farid Farada. And Amharic is a language spoken in Ethiopia where Jews have lived for more than 1,500 years. So Farada says that the theater in Israel gives proud and nourishing expression to community members and gives us a basis for preserving the beautiful language and culture we grew up with. And it answers the need of youngest in the community to identify with Amharic and is aimed then not only at adults, but to children. It's saying, be proud of your heritage. And another language that is featured in post-vernacular Hebrew, in, that is featured in post-vernacular in Israel, is Juhuri. And that is an endangered language spoken by Jews from Dagestan and Azerbaijan. So Rambam Mountain Jewish Theater is um, a theater in Israel. It began by a different name in the 1930s in Durbend, Dagestan, and it moved to Khadera, Israel in the 20th century. So it's brought theater in Juhuri to communities in Israel and in Russia and also in the United States and North America, and um, it's... Uh, it's recently ceased production, but um, I'd like to show a video that is from a few years back that uh, showcases showcases a comedy, a part of a comedy that they did, that they did. And I just think that's so wonderful, especially, especially including the um, the part of the audience that how much they were enjoying it and talking to each other about it and just connecting was just really struck me, and um, that was really important. I thought to include in in that video. So 
next next I'm gonna go to the next slide hopefully if it yes <laughs> so um, to conclude I want to say that in addition to storytelling and community building that has come from Jewish theater throughout the ages in modern times it preserves language in post vernacular contexts and it creates spaces for people to enjoy and to connect with both the language they used to speak and or the language that their parents spoke or their grandparents spoke or that they heard around the house or that they feel they feel ethnically and culturally connected to. And so um, again, I want to say thank you. And I'm working on this exhibit for theater um, on the Jewish Language Project website. So in the next couple of weeks, my internship will be coming to a close, sadly. But that does mean that my exhibit will be up. And so all of this information and more about Jews in the Renaissance in Italy and a million other things. Not a million. Don't count. It's not a million. Um, <laughs> um, but um, lots of other, lots of other instances and situations. So um, definitely um, keep an eye out for those things. And thank you so much um, to all of you for being here and for learning with us. And um, for those of you who sponsored this event, thank you, thank you, and um, we appreciate you so much. Um, so. With that, we will be finished. <laughs> um, thank you, Eleanor. That was amazing. And as you can see, she's amazing, right? Am I right? Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, so next we're going to, um, are we going to do a Q&A or yeah, no? Yeah, I think we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Stay if you want for Q&A um, for, for a few minutes. And before that, I do want to thank the sponsors by name as well. Um, so um, we have the thanks to the Oklahoma Faith Network, Museum of the Bible, Oklahoma Christian University's Beam Library, Temple B'nai Israel, Oklahoma Hillel, Emanuel Synagogue, Anita Barlow, Dr. Stephen and Roberta Sloan, Robin. It's my parents. <laughs> it's weird to say their first names. Um, Oklahoma City University's Wimberley School of Religion, Oklahoma City Community College World Languages and Cultures Center, Jewish Theater of Oklahoma, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Oklahoma City. So thank you all of you very much. Right, so uh, in Shanghai, there was a, an immigrant Jewish community that spoke Yiddish that moved to Shanghai, primarily during World War II, and did have Yiddish institutions there. Um, but there was also a Jewish community in Kaifeng uh, that spoke Chinese, and there is some evidence of texts that combine uh, Chinese characters with Hebrew characters and um, some names that include both biblical names and Chinese names together. Um, but there's very little evidence of how they spoke because by the time linguists became interested in this in the 20th century, it was too late and the community had uh, dissipated enough that there wasn't much to, to research.
and now we're leaving uh, the Yiddish classic. And some people started off with Ruben, so I'm a fan of the Rubens too. And uh, I hear a lot of, uh, uh, not maybe not a lot, but I hear people speaking about there being a Yiddish Renaissance. I don't know, have you seen examples of that? Other than <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think when we were talking about the post vernacular engagement, this is a part of it. People gathering to read Yiddish, even if they don't know so much, and maybe some people know more than others, some fluent speakers, some who have very little knowledge, coming together to engage with the language. And a reading circle like a Leyenkreis or a Schmuzkreis, a speaking circle, are quite common. And I do see all that as part of a Yiddish Renaissance. But it's important to note that it's not a Renaissance in using the language for primary communication, it's a renaissance in post-vernacular engagement. Uh, any questions about theater? Uh, okay, yeah? That's a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I think that I read something that in recent years there has been activity in Yiddish theater in Chicago, um, but I don't want to say that definitively because I wrote it down and I am not reading it right now. Um, but I, I do say that I, I did read that recently that has been happening and for sure in New York and, um, and other places for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so to start, in terms of resources for learning Ladino, I absolutely can. Um, anyone, let me know because I have I have access to to websites that um, I have access. I found classes and different lectures, especially by, I mentioned Karen Gershon Sarchon. She has had lectures about, um, about teaching and um, especially about Ladino he humor. Um, it's a, she says it's a very funny language and there are a lot of idioms that are just very, very evocative. And she teaches, she taught a class that I think was recorded or that has some records from that that might help that um, that taught it through that that lens and that frame. And um, definitely I can send that to you and anybody else let me know. Um, yeah, and I, I can write down who that was and yeah, and definitely let me know for sure. And then in terms of the, the congregational aspect, I agree, it's very exciting. And I think there are a lot of different ways that we can engage in um, in language in a post-vernacular way in our congregations. And one, one way that I think that we already sort of do is that um, although... Hebrew is a thriving language in Israel. A lot of us in Oklahoma City don't speak it, and yet we are engaging with it in our in our Sidurim. And when we say our prayers, we say them a lot of times in Hebrew. And sometimes we know what we're saying, and sometimes we don't. And sometimes it's just it's just the the act of saying things and singing things in Hebrew, and with the tunes then that we know, and with the the words that that 
just form in our mouths because we've heard it so much and um, that in and of itself. But I think that there's absolutely space for for more post vernacular engagement with other languages like Yiddish and Ladino and Judeo Arabic and different languages with we could have things like um, like Anita's group of of Yiddish Yiddish speaking or Yiddish learning and having having more more engagement in that way for sure. Um, it's a great thing to talk about, for sure. <laughs> Theater-wise, yes. if one were to stage a production in a language that is not in the community, how, how would you do that? You know, if you were to bring you this theater here, right. yeah. how would you do it? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of ways to do it. One way is to have to have surtitles, to have subtitles like on like a screen above or below, um, or to have a synopsis in the in the program. Because one way one way that I I read from a lot of different scholars that have studied Jewish theater is that um, they feel like even if you don't fully speak the language you have some sort of frame of reference of how stories how stories on stage look and work and so there's some sort of context of like okay like this with the with the costumes and the way they're interacting i kind of see where we're at in kind of the arc of the story and then to have a synopsis in your program in english or in the local used language then you can have that and then follow sort of what's going on or to have subtitles or yeah there are different ways to do that for sure yeah beverly that the way we've always done it in opera? yeah <laughs> that's true that's true yeah um, roberta Oh, wow. So if we could bring him in to do it in English and Yiddish, that would be really great. Mm -hmm. So if anybody would like to donate and support them. <laughs> yeah, the, the Jewish Theater of Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Karen. In Jewish English? In Jewish English? <laughs> um, you okay. Want, you want that we should speak English? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also, Here, go ahead. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, we do all that shtick to be misamech, the chosin and kala. Uh, right? And in, in Orthodox communities, it's much more distinctive, a lot of Hebrew and Yiddish. Yeah. 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 Or... or um, or at Oneg we schmooze and we have to stay a long time because oh my mom has to schmooze with with everyone and the, she loves doing it but oh sometimes I just want to go to bed and take a schluff and you know like using Yiddish in there and yeah. Well, thank you all so much, and um, thank you. <laughs> and, and feel free to take snacks to go. There's, yeah. there's a lot of food. Or stay in snacks. Stay in snacks snack and schmooze, nosh, you know, all the words. <laughs>